Hi, my name is Dominic Artruni and I'm the founder and director of Concave Brand Tracking. We're the world's only market research company entirely dedicated to recording and analyzing brands and entertainment. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you about how to measure product placement. Whether you just wanna understand the methodology, want to do it yourself, or want to find a company to do it for you. So, there are three main aspects to measuring product placement. First, selecting the sample. Second, collecting the right data. And three, using that data in the best way possible. Let's start with picking the right sample. This can vary wildly depending on the size of your product placement program, your budget, and your goals. It can go from measuring just one product placement to analyzing every single brand across a whole spectrum of entertainment. Obviously, the cost associated with these two ends of the spectrum goes up pretty linearly. Roughly speaking, the more time it takes to collect the data, the more expensive it's going to be. But beyond costs, it's important to figure out from the start what it is you're trying to get out of your product placement measurement. Broadly speaking, there are three main goals. The most basic one is measuring your own product placement. This usually takes the form of a dollar valuation. Secondly, there's comparing yourself to your competitors. This could be a head-to-head -head with your main rivals, or you could select a seven or eight of your main competitors and see how you're comparing for them. Or you could decide to look at all the brands in your product category. By using that last option, you have the possibility of looking at what your market share is. And finally, the biggest goal you can have with measuring product placement is understanding where your brand fits in in the more global landscape. Are you a big fish in a small pond or a medium fish in a big pond? After all, being the fifth biggest car manufacturer in film or TV still means you're going to be getting more value than any brand that's the leader in their much smaller product category. For the latter two goals, looking at your competitors and understanding your overall position in the product placement industry, it is important to pick a sufficiently big sample, but also a sample that's objective, but more on that later. Also, these goals don't function in either or. More, they stack. If you want a basic measurement, you're gonna just do the valuations. But if you're a large brand spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on your measurement program, as well as knowing what your market share and where you rank overall, you're still gonna to want to know how much your individual placements were worth. Now let's look at some concrete examples of the samples that brands might pick depending on their size and their budget. We'll start with a basic example of a small brand that's done a few product placements in a year. In this case, we would suggest simply doing a valuation for all of their placements. This could range from a couple of hundred to a couple of thousand dollars. Now, say you're a larger brand and you've done about a hundred placements across film, TV, and music, and all you wanna do is value them. In this case, we build a custom work program, probably costing somewhere between five and $50,000, depending on the number of placements. In some cases, a brand like this will wanna assign a value to every placement they do, or in other cases, they might just wanna pick out the ones that they think are gonna make them look best, i.e. were worth the most money. Finally, a global brand that plows millions of dollars into their brand and entertainment program is understandably gonna to wanna to quantify every aspect of what people are seeing in entertainment. They're going to want to know what their market share is. They're going to want to know how they compare to their competitors, and they're gonna to wanna to know how much value they're getting from their product placements. To tick all three of these boxes, you in essence need to do two pieces of work. First, you've got the basic project of simply valuing all the placements this brand has done. This is basically the same as the first two examples, but on a much larger scale. But then, as I mentioned, to get information like market share or a complete competitive view of every brand in your product category, you need to go through a representative sample in film or TV, and you need to record either all the brands that appear, if you wanna know where your brand ranks overall, or at the very least, every single brand in your product category. By recording every single brand in your product category, you're gonna be able to see what percentage of the available product placement value your brand is getting. When I talk about market share, that's what I'm talking about. So a brand that can say that they have 40 or 50% of all of the available product placement value in their product category is doing a hell of a job. Alternatively, the market share leader doesn't necessarily have to have astronomically high percentages. In the car industry, for example, it's very rare for one car to have more than 10% of all of the available value. But as I mentioned earlier, to do this properly, you need a big enough sample, which usually means that it, the sample needs to represent a certain percentage of the available product placement, and also it needs to be objective. In the case of movies, you could pick the top 50 or the top 100 movies in a given year. In the case of TV, it's a lot harder because obviously there's a lot more TV shows than there are movies. 
but you can still pick a representative sample, like say the top 10, 20, 30 most viewed shows in the world. And for this full package, including a complete valuation of all of your brand's placements, as well as market share information and a full view of all your competitors across film, TV, and music, you're looking at over $100,000. So now that you've figured out what sample is appropriate for you, what about the data? Well, much like with the sample, there are various levels. When a brand appears in entertainment, there's numerous pieces of information that can be recorded. And of course, the more you record, the more time it takes, and hence, the more expensive it is. Some brands are satisfied with very high level of information, while some want really granular data. Let's take an example. Your brand appears in a TV show. You could stop right there, literally just knowing that your brand's in a TV show. Some brands are content enough to just know how many movies or how many TV shows they're in. But say you want to get further in. Okay, so your brand is in a TV show, but what's the product? This might seem basic, but recording the product can be very important, especially if you're doing a big data collection. Imagine that you're Triumph Motorcycles and you want to look at your competitors. So you decide you're going to look at BMW and Yamaha. If the data you're getting hasn't taken into account the product, you're not going to be able to strip out pianos and cars when doing this comparison because obviously Triumph is only going to want to look at BMW and Yamaha motorcycles and none of their other products. So now you've got your qualifying data points. You know what type of entertainment you're in, you know the title, and you know the product. Now let's look at the exposure. Roughly speaking, the exposure takes into account how much people are actually seeing. Now, the first element to that is the screen time. How long is your brand on screen? Again, some brands will stop there because at this point you're, you're getting a much better picture than just saying, I'm in five TV shows, if you know that you got three hours of screen time in that TV show. But it is also important to find a way to differentiate between 10 seconds in the background and 10 seconds in the close-up. For that, we turn to the quality of exposure. Now that can include discernibility, which means how visible your product is, but also whether or not their logo is visible. These are all different elements for exposure and you can choose if you want all of them or just some of them. The other critical element to evaluating your exposure is to know how many people are watching any given movie, TV show, or online content. Once you have the exposure, the viewership, you then figure out the cost of 30 second commercials on US TV, or as we call it, the cost of traditional advertising. And you factor all of these elements together and that's when you produce the valuation. So what this means is that when someone says that a product placement is valued at $1 million, they're saying that to achieve the same exposure in terms of how visible it was on screen and how many people are seeing it, it would have cost you $1 million in traditional advertising. In this way, a successful TV or movie product placement can be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions, upon the initial release, and multiple times that over time. It is very important to consider the lifetime value of a product placement and not just the bang that you get for your buck upon the initial release of a movie or the first airing a TV show. Very quickly, these become available on in-flight entertainment, they get downloaded illegally, they get bought or rented both online and still physically, and then finally, in this world of streaming, most content will end up on Netflix, Amazon, Disney+, Plus, or any of the many other streaming services available today. In this way, content's audience will continue to grow forever along with the value of your product placement. It's for this reason that in the industry, product placement is referred to as the gift that just keeps on giving. Another type of data that can be recorded is demographic information. This can be the names of the actors who are associated with the brands, as well as their age, their gender, and their ethnicity. Recording all of this allowed Concave Brand Tracking in 2019 to determine that Robert Downey Jr. was the actor associated with the most brand value in 2019 movies. That the average age for brand users was 39, and that brands are only associated with women in 23% of their screen time. You can also look at contextual information. This could be where a brand is appearing, what it's being used for, or what associations are being made from its portrayal. After all, a car being used to drop the kids off at school is gonna come across very differently to viewers than one being used to speed away from a bank robbery. Or a laptop being used in a spy context is gonna come across very differently than one being used to Skype between two teenagers. So you've selected the perfect sample to measure your product placement program. You've rigorously decided the exact metrics that you need and you spent laborious hours combing through recording that data. Congratulations. But now, what do you do with it? Broadly speaking, there are three main uses for product placement measurement data. 
The first is justifying product placement's existence. The second is understanding what people are seeing in entertainment. And the third is strategic planning. One of the main reasons to measure product placement is to justify it. Unlike a salesman or a builder who can tangibly show what the result of their labor is, it's a lot more complicated with product placement. Sure, you can see your product appearing on screen, but how do you link that to tangible value without the data behind it? As we've seen, the most common metric for this is the valuation, which is achieved by comparing product placement to traditional advertising. One of the reasons why it's so popular in the industry is because everyone can relate to a dollar amount. The benefit of this tool is that not only can you see what was a good product placement and what was not, but it's also a great way of showing the amazing return on investment product placement achieves. Most product placements cost little to nothing, meaning their ROIs can be in the hundreds if not the thousands, especially when you look over the entire life cycle of the placement. Furthermore, contrary to popular belief, product placement isn't about getting people to immediately get off their couch and buy your product, although there are some exceptions. Rather, it is a long-term marketing technique meant primarily to build brand awareness and secondarily to shape your perception of a brand. Because we don't need to buy a new laptop or a new car or a new watch every day, but the idea of product placement, along with a lot of traditional advertising, is to make it part of your subconscious. That when you think of laptops, you think of Dell. That when you think of cars, you think of Ford. That when you think of sports clothing, you think of Under Armour. And then one day, you're going to be in the market for one of those products. And all of that marketing is going to come to the front of your mind. And while product placement experts understand most of this, it's also important to be able to relay it to non-experts. Whether you're a product placement agency reporting back to the PR department of your client, or you're the head of product placement internally reporting to the chief marketing officer of your company. This brings us to understanding what people are seeing. By recording the contextual and demographic data on how your brand is being portrayed, you can develop an understanding of how the audience is perceiving you. Is your brand being shown as cool, professional, or family-oriented? Is it being used by men or women? Young people or old people? White people or minorities? The key here is to compare how you want to be portrayed with what people are actually seeing. Now, you can do this just in regards to your own brand, but to have a true understanding of what the audience is seeing, it's really important here to look at other brands. After all, I can tell you that the average age of Ford drivers in film is 43. But that won't really tell you anything until I tell you that 43 is actually the exact average for car manufacturers. And Chevrolet, Chrysler and Cadillac have higher average ages, while Toyota, Land Rover and Mercedes have lower ones. Similarly with exposure. Knowing that you got $10 million worth of product placement advertising value in film last year is a great achievement. But if you really want to understand how visible your brand is, it's very important to know whether your competitors are getting more or less value than you. And that's not to say that being number one is the most important goal. While brands like Ford, Dell, and Nike dominate their areas, many are far more niche and prioritize appearing in the right context over being omnipresent. Think of Panasonic laptops appearing in military contexts, Steinway and Sons pianos appearing in luxurious contexts, or Canada Goose being worn in the extreme cold. So everyone knows what a great job you're doing with your product placement, and you have a perfect understanding of how the audience see your brands and your competitors. So now what? Well, all this data can also be really important for future planning. First, you can look at what factors drove your exposure. Maybe one show is getting you lots of screen time, but its ratings just aren't amazing. And you might want to shift resources to a show with higher ratings where you're not getting enough screen time. You can also identify your weaknesses, like your logo not being visible enough or your products not appearing prominently enough. It's very important to be familiar with the variables behind your valuation, both to understand the figures that you're using, but also to improve them over time. Similarly, with the demographic and the contextual data, if it shows that you're exactly where you want to be, then you can focus on staying there. But if your average age is a little high or you're not being associated with women enough, then you can take action based on that information. So that's how you measure product placement. From selecting the sample to analyzing the data, I hope I've given you all the information you need. If you'd like more information on this topic or are looking for a partner to help you with your product placement measurement, look no further than Concave Brand Tracking.
We live and breathe entertainment marketing data and would love to help you. We offer all of our clients a completely custom work program based entirely on what their needs and their budget is. We track thousands of brands across film, TV, music, and any other type of entertainment our clients appear in. We have our own in-house model to value product placement, as well as to estimate the lifetime viewership of movies and TV shows. We're also the only company in the world to publish an annual top 100 brands in product placement list. You can find it on our website, www.concavebt.com, along with loads of other cool case studies. Finally, you can contact us at info at concavebt.com, and you can follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for watching.